Welcome to the Defence Forces podcast brought to you by the Defence Forces Public Relations Branch. Hello and welcome to the Irish Defence Forces podcast. My name is Captain Keen Clancy and today we welcome onto the show Minister for Defence and Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr Simon Coveney TD. And we're going to have a conversation about some of the big ticket items currently on the Irish defence landscape. Welcome on to the show, Minister. Thanks very, very much for coming on. Well, thanks very much for asking me. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I suppose we'll we, we kick straight into it. I, usually I would ask people to kind of introduce themselves and give us a bit about their background, but I think anybody listening to this will know who you are already. So, so we, we heard anecdotally within the Defence Forces that you actively look to take on the defence portfolio at, at the beginning of the current government. Can you give us an insight into why that was? Yeah, I mean that is true. I mean, I, I um, you know, I wanted to to get back into the defence portfolio because I I felt that I had been in defence before, but it was really only for eighteen months or so. And um, at the time, uh, we were trying to finalise the white paper on defence. If you remember, it was 2014, 2015. Um, and for me, uh, you know, I live pretty much next door to the naval base in Cork. Um, uh, I was really interested when I was asked to take on the the defence brief the last time, but I was also Minister for Agriculture and Fisheries. It was a very different kind of brief for me. And I had felt that I had a lot of unfinished business, to be honest with you. Um, You know, for me, I was really starting to get comfortable with the defence brief, really interested in it, getting to know the personalities and the senior leadership within the defence forces and also the Department of Defence. And so... Um, to only have 18 months for me wasn't enough. Uh, mm-hmm. And I wanted to get back to defence policy and the defence brief, but this time with the co- in the context of also being a Minister for Foreign Affairs. Yeah, and I was actually going to ask you about that, Minister, that it must be a huge workload to have the two ministries. Well, I, I see it as a, as a sort of a complementary workload, if you like. So for me, the um, like foreign policy and defence policy have so much overlap. Um, and... Uh, I had made the case to the Taoiseach and the Nautonishta that, you know, if you're going to match defence up with something, uh, foreign affairs is is the is the best match. Um, and uh, I also have always felt that defence needs a senior minister around the cabinet table um, and somebody who's obviously interested and passionate about it. Uh, and so uh, for me, being a minister for foreign affairs, um, I knew I was going to stay as Minister of Foreign Affairs and to be asked to take on the extra responsibility of defence as well um, meant that, you know, I'm now representing Ireland at the UN Security Council with a with defence as well as a foreign affairs brief uh, within the European Union. Likewise, foreign policy and uh, common defence and security, lots of overlap there. Uh, and of course, you know, I see our peacekeeping operations abroad as an extension of Irish foreign policy in terms of peace intervention, uh, conflict management, post-conflict management, um, and in many ways the uh, the work that our defence forces do abroad gives me a credibility in mm-hmm. parts of the world that in my view I mightn't otherwise have. And to have the, um, the defence brief and foreign policy brief, f- for example, even in the last few days, you know, I've been very vocal internationally on the Middle East peace uh, process and violence of the last few days, uh, and I think you know being able to have the credibility of being a minister for defence that has obviously a defence force presence in southern Lebanon and on the occupied Golan, you know, gives us real skin in the game in terms of what's happening in that region and the feedback we get both through defence infrastructure as well as uh, diplomatic channels. Yeah. Um, and you know, like if you want a good example of how the overlap can be used to good effect. Uh, you might remember when the bomb went off in the the harbor in uh, uh, in Beirut, yeah, um, yeah. and it, with devastating impact. And actually, as a country, they haven't recovered since. But like we responded quickly to that by using our Department of Foreign Affairs diplomatic channels uh, and using Defence Force intelligence within UNIFIL uh, to you know within within twenty four thirty six hours we had you know an Air Corps. Uh, plane flying PPE equipment uh, yeah. for for hospitals in Beirut. Funny enough, what, one of our producers actually was uh, who's who's here today. He was actually on the flight himself yeah. as it, to kind of document it. Yeah. Yeah. So so for me, that was a classic example of me linking up my you know political director in the Department of Foreign Affairs, senior management in the Department of Defence, and the chief of staff in the Defence Forces, banging heads together and saying, look, how can we use the infrastructure that we have across both departments here in in terms of influence, diplomacy access, 
um, intelligence on the ground to respond quickly. And we did. Um, and, you know, there are other examples of that too. You know, I mean, I, I'm involved in debates at a Security Council level now on the Horn of Africa, uh, the Sahel, um, and the intelligence that we get from our two peacekeeping missions in Mali, uh, the UN mission, obviously, uh, where we're embedded with a German contingent, and and then on the, the EU training mission, yeah, where training we also mission. partner. You know, it just gives, in my view, uh, it gives me uh, a credibility and an access as a minister for foreign affairs that allows me to be more impactful and more credible. It enhances and, both of your both of your sides from from what well, I, I can hope see. so. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, I hope so. And you know, we'll see now. And I know we'll talk about it later on in terms of the uh, the commission on the future of the defence forces. I mean, for me, the defence forces are, uh, of course, they are a a resource for a state in terms of domestic security. But from an Irish perspective, they're also an extraordinary resource in terms of, of Irish impact and influence in other parts of the world. And, you know, when, when our defence forces in uniform are abroad, they're, they're soldiers, they're warriors, they're peacekeepers, but they're also diplomats. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I remember making the decision, actually, as a defence minister to send a ship to the Mediterranean uh, that time when, when the Irish public were just, you know, disgusted by the loss of life in the Mediterranean. They wanted us to do something. Um, I remember calling the flag officer at the time, uh, who's now retired, to say, you know, if we made the political call to send a ship to the Med, could you do it? Uh, do we have the, um, the capacity to be able to respond in that way, as opposed to doing what Ireland often does, which is to just make money available for an NGO? Yeah. Um, and I wanted us to have a much more hands-on response for that um, uh, and I thought it was a really good opportunity for the for the naval service to be to be central to a mission abroad which they hadn't really been before it was and, and that physical footprint is such a real a real huge thing oh, for the defense forces and, yeah. and for and for our reputation internationally as, as you've outlined minister I might we because I want to ask you a little bit more about kind of overseas as we go along and maybe our yeah, current yeah, missions no, no, as well uh, absolutely but just just yeah. to make the point that as uh, you know I mean neither of my briefs are secondary to the other yeah you know and I take my defense portfolio as seriously as I take my foreign foreign policy uh, and and foreign affairs portfolio, um, um, but I think that uh, and we you know we try to manage them in terms of time management uh, as best I can. Obviously, they're very busy portfolios, um, but but they do complement each other. And I hope anyway that that you know members of the defence forces see their minister in different parts of the world speaking out on global issues, whether it's you know, uh, the Iranian nuclear deal, whether it's peace in, uh, in uh, Somalia, uh, whether it's interventions in Tigray in, in Ethiopia, whether it's talking about our, our presence in Mali or more recently, obviously, Israel-Palestine issues. Mm. Uh, you know, and I hope they, they have a connection with what I'm saying because in many ways, they're the people on the ground in some of these locations uh, actually trying to enforce and manage and, and influence a peace process that I talk about politically all the time. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I, I hope that contributes to, to a, self of, a sense of self-worth within the defence forces and, uh, and, and ultimately morale. Yeah, I mean, the, but there is there is a certain amount of logic to it, and you know, to the way it works. But what I, what I might ask you about now, Minister, is just kind of the roles of defence forces on Ireland and how you kind of envision them yeah. into the future. And like, there's been a certain amount of commentary about, say, gaps in Ireland's national defence capabilities with regard to land, sea, air, and, and cyber capabilities. And is this something that that we're looking to examine, or, or like, how do you see the, the roles m- yeah. developing? Yeah, I mean, look, the truth is that we spend a lot less on defence than a lot of other countries do. Uh, we know that. Let's be honest about it. We've made choices in terms of where we prioritize spend uh, within defense infrastructure and within the defense forces. Um, And we've got to assess all the time whether those priorities need to change, uh, whether we need to adapt to new realities, new threats, changes in circumstance. Um, And that is what the, you know, the the built-in review processes of the white paper are all about. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why every few years we've got to actually take a good look at ourselves in the mirror and say, are we fit for purpose? Are we planning for the future appropriately? Are we spending enough money? Uh, and if not, why not? Uh, and it's up to me to make that case. Uh, I mean, we have seen actually quite a significant increase in defence budgets in the last number of years, but I think that needs to continue. 
Um, and as you I said, mean, your role as the Department of Foreign Affairs, as the Minister, yeah. as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, is a good way you can see what's coming in I international so, space. Know, uh, and yeah, be, because I mean, a lot of the conversations and debates that, that I have with, with other foreign ministers around the world actually do uh, involve defence and security issues, um, cyber security threats, uh, undermining of democracy, um, uh, breaches in international humanitarian law. Like these things have a defence and a peacekeeping consequence often, um, even on climate. You know, um, most of the uh, conflict, conflict zones around the world are also areas that are being deeply impacted by, by climate change. Um, and, uh, and that's not a, a coincidence alone yeah. um, uh, in, in terms of the impact of, of climate change on already stressed populations and so on. Uh, the movement of people because of you know, unavailability of land or water uh, and um, conflict over scarce resources and so on. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, but I mean, just coming back to our own defense capacity, I mean, I do think we are limited in certain areas. I mean, you know, people have raised with me that we don't have sufficient radar capacity of the uh, of parts of the the west and southwest coast um, in terms of uh, having a a detailed enough picture uh, in terms of the airspace that we're responsible for that's an issue mm -hmm. uh, and it's a priority but I've got to weigh that priority against other investment priorities that we have too uh, we have a five year capital investment program which you guys will know all about you know uh, in terms of army air corps uh, and naval service. Um, uh, we've got to make sure that you have the capacity to be able to do the work that the, the state asks of you safely yeah. with modern equipment, the best training facilities, um, so that when you're in a, a theatre of conflict, you are as safe as you possibly can be. Um, and so that's my primary focus, you know, which is whether it's you know, upgrading our MOAG fleet, whether it's buying new CASAs uh, or PC-12s, uh, whether it's new ships, mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's body armor um, uh, or whether it's improved telecommunication capacity, uh, training facilities and gymnasiums, uh, you know. Just your basic uh, infrastructure yeah, and your are, accommodations yeah, and so the various bits. This is about modernizing, improving and changing infrastructure all the time. That's the stuff that you expect that, that, that we must do. And then I think we need to think beyond that and say, well, how are we planning for the future beyond maintaining capacity uh, to actually anticipate the 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 potential threats of, of the future, and, yeah, and asks in five years' time, ten years' time, or two or three years' time. I think one of those areas is certainly around cyber, mm -hmm. cybersecurity. Uh, we have actually quite a good capacity within the defence forces around a response to cyber, but I think we need to build on it even further. I'd be very surprised if one of the recommendations coming from the Commission isn't to invest significantly in cyber capacity. Um, we have, of course, uh, seconded some people to the um, to the, the the European Centre for for Research in terms of cybersecurity in in Tallinn in, um, in in Estonia, and I think we will learn lessons from that and look to apply them here. Of course, that involves other government departments as well. But um, but I think um, I think the Defence Forces and the Department of Defence will be central to that discussion. Um, you know, one of the things I've asked Aidan O'Driscoll and the the commission to look at is is the balance between Army Air Corps and Naval Service and of course the reserve, uh, which I think is a is a completely underutilized resource. And as a result of that, we haven't seen anything like the kind of numbers that we should have in the reserve. No, they, exactly. And it has suffered like the yeah. action, quite yeah. frankly. So I want to change that. Uh, I've made that I've signaled that intent quite clearly. We have a new piece of legislation coming through uh, which was a pretty mundane piece of legislation, actually, on defence, and and I've introduced uh, amendments to that that can legally allow, because at the moment, uh, a member of the reserve can't actually serve on an overseas mission legally, uh, and I'm changing that so that actually we're giving the option now to to the Commission and the Future of the Defence Forces to to make recommendations uh, in in terms of uh, what I hope will be quite a significant increased role for reservists mm -hmm. uh, in a way that complements, obviously, uh, the permanent defence forces. This isn't about uh, reservists doing work that permanent defence force members would otherwise be doing and therefore limiting uh, promotions and so on. It's actually quite the opposite. It's about creating a complementary pool of resource, particularly in specialist areas, 
uh, where, uh, where, where we can rely on that resource in certain instances, both at home and abroad. And in line, in line I would say, with, with other countries as well. I mean, I yeah. would have served overseas with, with reserves from Finland and from, from, from Estonia. Like, yeah. you know, well, so. I mean, the whole idea of a single force concept is that you have a permanent defence forces that are, um, that are essentially the core of, of your capacity uh, in terms of defence um, uh, capability. And then you have a reserve that you can access quickly uh, and um, uh, and uh, when needed, they can supplement and complement significantly uh, what the permanent uh, defense forces are doing. And I don't think we have enough of that at the moment, quite frankly. You know, a lot of people who are in the reserve have said to me, look, we have, we do a lot of training, but it kind of stops at that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, for me, reservists aren't just about dealing with a national emergency, if and when that ever happens. Uh, they need to be, I think, more involved in the day-to-day planning of uh, of defence capacity and peacekeeping operations, and hopefully, in the years ahead. And I know we'll be involved in in some quite complex uh, missions, I'm sure, in the future, as we have been in the past. Uh, and um, I see no reason why reservists, particularly with specialist skill sets, can't be part of that. Fantastic. You mentioned the Commission on Defence, and I'm going to move slightly into that. Um, so much has obviously been made recently of the ongoing commission on, on the future of the Defence Forces. So obviously members of the Defence Forces are very happy to see a commission in place and, and to see these, these developments being made, but whether it will yield meaningful results for serving members is something that I think a lot of people are kind of asking. What would you say to serving members that might say that such a thing, the Commission on the Defence Forces, is a paper exercise and, and how are we going to implement the recommendations of, of the commission? Yeah, well, look, I mean, trust me on this, this is not a paper exercise. Um, I wouldn't have asked Aidan O'Driscoll, who is a civil servant that I have huge time for. Um, I mean, just to give you the background of this from my perspective, I mean, we, I was involved in finalizing the negotiations around the program for government. Um, I was very involved in actually the text on the defense element of that. Um, And um, I feel very strongly that there is a need in some ways for a kind of a recalibration and a new beginning for uh, for defence in terms of the debate around defence policy and, and of course, the kind of rebuilding of morale within the defence forces as well. Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, I don't want to say that the, that the Commission on the Future of Defence Forces will do all of that on its own, but, but I think it can make a significant contribution to it. Um, I asked the, the civil servant that I would, um, that I would have known um, I wouldn't say known best, but I certainly know him very well. Um, he was my Secretary General when I was in the Department of Agriculture uh, and Marine. Uh, he then moved to the Department of Justice at a time when the Department of Justice was under real pressure. You know, there had been um, uh, a number of Guard Commissioners had to resign, a number of Justice Ministers had to resign. Uh, you know, Justice and the Department of Justice was the source of a lot of scandal and mm-hmm. political problems. Uh, Aidan was essentially headhunted in there and managed to create a program of reform and change that I think has been very credible and successful. I mean, there hasn't been any scandal in in the justice area since. Um, and so, you know, he retired, but has lots of energy, has lots of interests as well uh, that I share in terms of Africa, development, foreign policy. What I didn't know, actually, was how interested and passionate he is about defence. Uh, the former reservist. Uh, exactly. Reserve, sure. exactly. Yeah. I didn't know that when I asked him. Um, and I said, look, Aidan, I need somebody who's tough, who's not willing to be, or who, who's willing to be controversial if necessary, and willing to be quite radical if necessary in terms of recommendations. Um, will you take this on? Um, and he said he would. And then he told me that actually, you know, uh, I, I have a, a real interest in the defence forces, myself, my family, um, and um, so, you know, I think he's a good choice um, and he's doing a difficult job because he has probably more people than he thought he would have. You know, 15 people on the, on the commission is probably slightly too many, mm-hmm. but we were trying to keep everybody happy. Um, uh, but there's, and there's no shortage of big personalities, big egos, um, a lot of knowledge uh, in terms of, you know, former chiefs of staff, um, you know, very high ranking officers, um, and and then obviously um, academics uh, um, uh, and uh, and and civil servants. So 
you know, nobody could argue, I think, that those 15 people aren't uh, a, a very experienced group of people who know what they're talking about. So the challenge will be, how do we harness that resource to produce a series of recommendations that I think can be exciting for the Defence Forces mm -hmm. in terms of a pathway for the future and can deliver on some of the things that many, I think, in the Defence Forces have been frustrated by in terms of perhaps getting more clarity on remuneration, uh, paying allowances, um, you know, opportunities for promotion, uh, the kind of things that people don't want to talk about publicly often, but obviously care about in terms of their own careers and their yeah, own course, income yeah. and families and so on. So, you know, I, I don't think that the commission is, is going to be able to provide all of the answers there. Uh, I think the commission is mandated to look at pay structures and allowances in the defence forces, whether they're structured and streamlined in the way that they should be, uh, whether there are certain ranks within the defence forces that aren't getting fair treatment. Um, and so I think they will look at international best practice uh, and make some decisions around that. Um, whether they're going to make dramatic decisions around pay rates, probably not. Um, but certainly they are mandated to look at both structures and allowances. What we've committed to doing then, though, on, on the pay side, is, is to set up an independent body uh, to, um, uh, to, to review uh, pay in the defence forces. So for the first time, uh, we will have a section of the public service, if you like, that will have its own pay, pay review body. Um, and I think that's appropriate because people who commit a career to the Defence Forces, they're quite unique, actually, in terms of public service. You know, you take an oath to the state. Mm -hmm. um, I know that matters to you, and so it should. Uh, Honestly, yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think joining the Defence Forces is a form of, of patriotism, quite frankly. That's how I've described it um, many times. There's a vocational element to it. It's a vocation. Really, yeah. um, and when you take that oath, it means, you know, you can't take industrial action, you can't strike, you can't get involved in political campaigns. Um, now, I know we have, uh, we, we have our own structures within defence infrastructure around arbitration and, uh, and dispute resolutions and so on, but, but I still think on the core issues around pay and allowances, um, because uh, a career in the defence forces is unique versus other elements of the public sector, um, I think for that reason, it more than justifies having its own specific and permanent pay review body. Uh, that'll be able to make recommendations as we go. So this isn't a review, a review body that'll look at it, produce a report, and then be gone. We're talking about having a permanent review body th that's there remember. producing reports every year. And I'm sure our members would be very glad to hear you say that because I was going, actually going to ask you about that, Minister, whether this was still going to be something that's going to, that's going to be done. Oh, yeah, I mean, so. this is in the Programme for Government. Um, it was part of the deal, essentially, around how we move defence. Now, look, there, there are different perspectives on, on what we should be doing around pay and conditions in the defence forces. You know, PD4 would make the case very strongly that they would like to see uh, affiliation with ICTU. And, uh, you know, they, they, they are very strongly of that view. I haven't ruled that out, um, but I have been honest with them to say that I have some concerns in relation to it, um, given some of the issues that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then, of course, you know, RACO has made the case very strongly that, that they want to see this separate pay body. Um, so there are differences of opinion and perspectives. We'll have to wait and see how, the, how it works out. But, but the programme for government is, is pretty clear on the commitment here. At the end of the commission period when it reports, uh, then I will negotiate essentially with, with Michael McGrath, uh, the Minister for Public Expenditure, to, uh, to design and construct this, uh, this independent pay body. So I'm actually going to ask you a question that I asked um, Aidan O'Driscoll, Minister, which is a bit, and I'd refer to it as, as the elephant in the room at the time. So, But I think it's something that for some people in the Defence Force is important to ask, which is there has been a good bit made in the media recently of the remit of the Commission on the Defence Forces and that it simply covers the Defence Forces and doesn't cover the Department of Defence. Yeah. So the Defence Force have undergone a number of different commissions and, 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 and things like that, like the Gleason Commission thing over the last 30 years. Well, the Department of Defence don't seem to have undergone something similar. Um, is this an ineffective statement that the Department of Defence doesn't need to change or it structurally finds it is? Or is there, how would you respond to people that would, would be unhappy yeah. that the Department of Defence don't fall under that remit? Yeah, yeah. No, look, I'm really glad you asked this question because it's important to address it because it, it gets raised with me all the time. Often, you know, confidentially by members of the Defence Forces, you know, they, they ask if they can have a word and, you know, why is it that effectively we're being reviewed? Um, now, like, 
the first thing I'd say is that I really think that members of defence forces shouldn't see the fact that we're reviewing essentially the defence forces as, as in any way a threat or a criticism. Actually, it's kind of the opposite. What it's about is, is looking at, at how we can invest in and plan for the future in a way that's very dynamic and I, I hope will be quite exciting for, for a lot of members of the Defence Forces in terms of their own careers. But of course we should apply the same rationale to the department and, and that is happening. So we are in parallel with the Commission on the Future of the Defence Forces, we are also going through a fundamental public sector review process for the Department of Defence which, trust me, is a fairly robust process okay. around uh, procedures, management, decision-making, um, efficiency, uh, and so on. Um, so, you know, Jackie McCrum, who's the, the new Secretary General in the department, uh, has welcomed this um, because I think we all need to be, whether it's my own office, whether it's the department, whether it's the Defence Forces, we've got to always be open to to uh, independent and constructive analysis and criticism and so on so that we can do things better, mm -hmm. you know? And um, like, if there's one thing I want to do uh, in terms of relationships and management while I'm in this role, is to try to improve the relationship between the department and the defense forces, because, you know, and I see this because I get caught in the middle all the time. You know, uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, I see very public criticism at times on social media and elsewhere of the department and some of the officials within the department, which is often very unfair and sometimes not accurate either. Um, um, so from my experience, we have a department in the Department of Defense that I think really do want to try to contribute to changing the relationship to make it a more positive one so that we're all seen to be on the same side trying to get things done on behalf of the defense family, if you like, whether that's civil servant or whether it's serving uh, personnel in the defense forces. And I think I have a big and important role to play in in trying to galvanize the collective resource of both. Um, and, uh, and we're gonna really work to try to do that. Uh, and likewise, I think sometimes in the department, there's a, there's a frustration uh, 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 at times uh, of what may be happening in the defense forces or, or whatever. And there's nobody quite criticism. as white as, you, as we so, have to be growing up and admit. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so look, I mean, if you look at the talent we have in both, it's pretty exceptional. You know, we have, you know, we have extraordinary talent in the Defence Forces and we have some really good civil servants in the Department of Defence. My job is to try to harness and ensure that the, that the collective is more powerful than the sum of its parts. And at the moment, I'm not sure that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so, yeah, but just to reassure people, what we could have done here was we could have had a commission on the future of Defence, Department and Defence Forces. I think if we had done that, the commission would have been dominated about by this debate in terms of the relationship between the two and uh, and both sides potentially blaming each other for for certain uh, issues and uh, and so on uh, instead what we've done is what i would uh, is we have a commission of the future of the defense forces which can focus solely on capacity uh, ability to be able to deliver on new challenges uh, um, resources um, uh, you know, pay structures, allowances, morale, recruitment, retention, the reserve. Like there's no shortage of issues there mm -hmm. to, to work on. And we have a pretty robust process, which is now starting in terms of reviewing how the department functions. Uh, we also then have, which I think is the most difficult area to get agreement and recommendations on, is the interaction between the two in terms of who does what, who, who has the decision-making process, the, the lines of command and so on, on certain issues. And the, the Chief of Staff and the, the Secretary General are mandated by me to work on this issue and to try to come up with agreed positions so that then we can feed that into to the reform that will be part of the Commission's work and indeed the, um, the review of the Department. So just to, to reassure people, because I know a lot of people read the mandate and they said, hang on a second, we're under the microscope here in the Defence Forces. Why isn't the department there? 
actually, as it, as it happens, there is, a re, there is a review process going on, which is a pretty re robust process, as I say, that departments go through, and it's happening in parallel with the, with the work of the Commission. I'm sure there's an awful lot of people who would appreciate the, that answer to the question, Minister. It was something, it was something that, that, if I hadn't asked, it would have been kind of remiss of me. But I, know, so, I mean, feel free to ask me whatever you want. Don't mm -hmm. worry. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to move slightly a... on, to, on, for, on from there, because I think you gave quite a comprehensive answer to that. And I'm just going to ask you about the Defence Force's involvement with the, with the Health Service Executive during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Do, do you feel that there has been an increase in public awareness of the Defence Forces oh, yeah. on foot of what's been going on over the last oh, no, 12 very, months? Very so? much so. In fact, I mean, I know so. Um, so, you know, last uh, last week I visited Porky Cueve, um and City Hall in Cork, uh, two of the big COVID vaccination centres, and uh, the Defence Forces are involved in both. And... Um, you know, when you speak to nurses and doctors that are there and the HSE management and you listen to how they talk about the sort of structure and organization and discipline that the Defence Forces bring to the to the partnership and the operation, you know, you'd be kind of proud to be to be a Minister for Defence, quite frankly. Um, likewise, um, you know, when we were trying to put together the mandatory hotel quarantine system, which, believe me, is not an easy system to put together from a policy perspective or indeed from an operational perspective. Um, again, you know, the, the HSE came to me and said, look, can the Defence Forces do this for us? You know, in terms of uh, ensuring that the management works, uh, that it, it operates as designed. Uh, we spoke to New Zealand about this, who, who have become very good at this, but they made a lot of, you know, mistakes like everybody does at the start. Uh, and they found that there was an increasing role month on month for the Defence Forces because of the structure and discipline that they bring. When you look at what the Defence Forces have done in terms of bringing uh, uh, test files to, uh, to, to laboratories in Berlin mm -hmm. in order to get tests results back quickly for people who are being tested for COVID, uh, when you look at the um, uh, the, uh, the transport facilities that that the defence forces have provided, when you look at uh, the testing on the quay side, that you know that uh, that some of our naval vessels have provided, um, uh, uh, yeah, or indeed the um, you know the operations in Dublin uh, uh, around the Aviva, where where again the defence forces are central to everything, or or when you go to the sort of Central command control, if you like, for all of the COVID operations, you know, which is a sort of a transformed gymnasium. Yeah. Um, you know, this is why we have the defense forces. You know, when a country is in trouble, uh, you are the last line of, of defense. You provide competence, professionalism, consistency, predictability. You know, when you, know you, ask, when you ask the defense forces to get something done, you don't have to ask a second time. You know, and that for me is is the value of, of the Defence Forces in a national crisis like this pandemic has been. You know, we've had nearly 5,000 people have died of COVID in, in Ireland in the last, what, 15 months or so. Um, the HSC were overwhelmed at times uh, by, by it, as was our health system generally. And, um, you know, that's when the Defence Forces get called in to help uh, with the civil authorities and, you know, they never say no, get on with the job, and, uh, and they're trusted. You know, by, they're trusted by the HSC, they're trusted by the government, they're trusted by the public. Um, people don't mess around in mandatory hotel quarantine uh, <laughs> facilities when someone's there in uniform. And uh, so, you know, that is, uh, I know it's, it's put some strain on the Defence Forces. People have had to come out of training cycles. Um, they've, they've had to adapt their routines to get things done. But... You know, I'd like to think that uh, that people sort of welcomed that challenge. I mean, that's why you join the Defence Forces, right? You, you join because you want to be a valuable asset to the state when when the state really needs um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, that resource. And, you know, the Defence Forces will continue to, uh, I think, play a very significant role as we move through hopefully what are the final stages of this pandemic in terms of the impact on society. And... Um, you know, whenever the Defence Forces do something different and interact with the public in a more direct way, I think that's a good thing. You know, and we've seen that as well in, in terms of some of the more severe storms and flooding incidents and so on in the last few years when the Defence Forces have been there with pumps, sandbags, working with local business people to try to save their businesses and homes and so on. And while that's not 
core defense in some ways. It is emergency management. And, um, and I think, um, you know, the, the resource that we have in the defense forces, the, the training and professionalism that's there, that is a resource that we do have to dip into at times. Yeah. You know, Ireland doesn't have the, the systems to have, um, uh, you know, separate reserves and forces for all those different eventualities, which is why the defense forces end up being asked to do a lot of things. I mean, we, you know, we operate the, um, the air ambulance, you know, operation out of a, a, a Athlone, which which was supposed to be a temporary, um, yeah. <laughs> supposed to be a temporary operation. All of a sudden, now it's permanent because we do it well. Um, and um, you know, so I I think in some ways, though, doing those civic uh, or taking on those civic roles when there's an emergency or when there's a gap in the system in terms of the capacity of the system to respond, and the defence forces fill that gap. I think it adds to the um, to the connection that the public have and the trust that they have in in um, in our defence forces, which is a good thing. And likewise, uh, you know, I mentioned it earlier when the when the uh, when the naval service sent sent ships to the Med. Again, I think you know there was a real spike in in interest in joining the naval service at that time, mm-hmm. and that that wasn't a coincidence. It was a phrase that was trotted out when I came into the press office first minister, which is that younger people wanted to do cool things that matter, was the phrase that was being thrown around the office when we were looking to recruit yeah. people. And I think that yeah, I think, I think that taps into something as part of that. But it, it's interesting, you've, met, you've mentioned a, a previous overseas mission with the Naval Service, but I actually want to ask a little bit about um, overseas and your views yeah. of overseas in the future. So obviously overseas is such a huge part of our service in the Defence Forces. Um, do you see us maintaining a similar level of commitment overseas following the Commission's report? Um, and will the, our presence on the UN Security Council um, affect that? Um, a couple of questions there. I mean, first of all, yes is the straight answer to maintaining the presence we have abroad. I mean, I, I uh, even if the Commission were to come back and make a recommendation to me that we should reduce our presence abroad, I would find it difficult to accept that recommendation. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think that the role that Ireland has in terms of peacekeeping abroad and peace missions abroad m- more generally is a huge part of Irish foreign policy now. Um, you know, we don't spend the kind of money that other countries do on defence. Um, we haven't invested in what many countries would regard as sort of conventional um, defence infrastructure in terms of defending a country against threat across a border and so on. You know, our our infrastructure, our investment is is very much built around, and our training systems are very much built around serving abroad in complex situations, as well as, of course, core defence issues, um, as well as fisheries patrols and, you know, uh, observations and so on. But we don't have um, uh, uh, a a similar defence infrastructure to many other countries in the world because we've chosen to prioritise peacekeeping. Uh, and I think we'll continue to do that. Um, whether or not we uh, we change over time the missions that we're involved in is a different question. I think we will. Um, and, that's one of the questions that's coming as part of this because yeah. there are certain members of the organisation that might see some of our current missions as we, we talked about the goal on earlier and maybe that might necessarily be included here but some of our current missions is maybe starting to stagnate a small bit yeah, so and people were wondering if there's a potential perhaps to be to end up maybe some missions perhaps in Africa or elsewhere yeah. or so I mean I think you know I, th- I mean we're in the middle of reviewing this very question actually um, and it's a, it's very much a, a debate that's led by the Defence Forces but involves the Department um, and, and I've been involved in a number of the discussions that we've already had. So we're assessing every mission we have. And there's a lot of missions, as you know, some of them involve some very small numbers of people. Others then are much bigger, like, like Unifil and Undoff. Um, the, um, I mean, I think the, the challenge for us is, um, you know, how do we ensure that the missions we're involved in are adding to our capacity as a country that contributes to complex peacekeeping missions? And maximizes the uh, the input um, of the skill set that Ireland can bring to global conflict management. Uh, and it, that sounds a bit lofty, I know, but <laughs> I hope people know what I'm talking, uh, you know, what I mean by saying that. So, like, we have a lot of experience in this space. Um, a lot of the peacekeeping missions of the next 10 years are going to be very complicated and actually quite difficult. Uh, a lot of them will involve peace enforcement 
as well as peace management. A lot of it will involve disarmament. A lot of it will involve post-conflict management uh, in, in places like the Horn of Africa, um, where we'll be dealing with difficult post-conflict situations in terms of sexual violence and a whole range of other things. And I do think that Ireland has the sophistication in terms of training and peacekeeping experience to really test ourselves in some of those very complex environments on behalf of the UN. Yeah. And I think we're going to be asked to as well. And we can say no, of course. Um, but, um, but if we're to change the focus in terms of some of our missions, that means leaving some missions behind to focus on, on new opportunities. Um, and of course, we have to ask ourselves the questions as to you know, which ones might they be. So just to reassure everybody, none of, the, none of our current missions are going to change anytime soon uh, with, with, the, well, with the possibility of, of one, uh, uh, perhaps in Western Sahara. Um, but there's, there's only two um, uh, serving personnel there. But in terms of our bigger missions, because if we make a strategic decision, for example, to make an increased contribution, for example, in the Sahel, uh, where there's a lot of demand for, for peacekeeping, uh, it would certainly take us three to four years probably to be able to train and equip for those new environments. So when we talk about maybe deploying to more robust missions, say, as, as we discussed possibly in Africa, you, you mentioned the Sahel, um, that it would require an increase in, as you said, a, a build-up over a number of years, but also an increase in force protection. And, and yeah. is this something that you'd look at as in a, a further investment into, for example, upgraded armour or upgraded... Force yes, protection. is the straight answer to that. So, you know, if we're going to make a strategic decision that at some point over the next four to five years, we're going to respond to asks from the UN to contribute to what are potentially more challenging and complex peacekeeping and peace enforcement missions, particularly in the continent of Africa, which is where I think they're likely to be, um, then we've got to make sure that we invest in both the training and the equipment for that. So we're very good at what we do in Undoff and Unifil. Um, we've been there in, in Unifil's case for a very long time. Um, and I think we provide a very valuable contribution there. If we're to change the, the environment that we're sending our, our personnel to, well, then we've got to also adapt the training, the equipment, the weapon, the weaponry, body armor, everything. And uh, to make sure that um, that people, as I said at the start, are as safe as they possibly can be in those complex environments, and particularly in Africa, we're seeing we're seeing regional conflict that is much more difficult to intervene on. So, you know, if you take Mali for example, and you look at the conflict there that has spilled over into the Lake Chad region, um, you know, into uh, uh, a whole range of of neighbouring countries. Um, it's a very different kind of mission than, for example, you know, an observation mission in the Golan Heights, which actually became very complicated a number of years ago, but is is hopefully less complicated now. Um, so, um, so you, the answer to your question is, I think we're likely to to look at at how we could respond to asks in in Africa, uh, because I think that's where a lot of these asks are going to come from. Um, and uh, and if we do that, there'll be quite a long lead-in time and there'll be an investment required in terms of equipment and training to make sure that we're ready to go um, by the time we actually deploy. So those strategic discussions are happening now and when they conclude, then we'll, then, then we'll plan the, um, the medium-term investment that's needed in, in equipment to be able to prepare for that properly. Fantastic. And that kind of ties in with a lot of what we've been talking about, keeping things under constant review as oh, yeah. from, from the commission to, to this. But yeah. I suppose coming to the kind of final question that, that, I'm, that I'm going to ask you as part of the of the show, what would you say you now to people that are coming towards, say, say leaving cert or coming towards the end of their college courses? The cadetship is currently open and, and there's also general service recruitment is currently open. What would you say to anybody out there who's thinking of joining the Defence Forces? I'd say it's a fantastic career. You know, I mean, I have to say at one point, I, uh, I thought seriously about joining the Naval Service myself. Um, uh, I couldn't make, my, make up my mind, quite frankly, and I didn't uh, in the end. But, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, joining the Irish Defence Forces, whether it's Air Corps, whether it's Naval Service, whether it's Army, uh, or whether it's being a reservist, you know, the, the, the opportunities, the training, the professional development, the discipline, the camaraderie, the friendships, 
Uh, it's not for everybody, but for a lot of people, uh, it can really build and mold uh, you know, somebody's personality in a really positive and rewarding way. You know, and uh, um, you know, I know there's been tension in relation to um, some of the debates around defense and recruitment and retention problems and challenges and uh, concerns around pay rates and so on in recent years. Um, we're really working hard to try to deal with, with areas that have been contentious uh, and that have undermined the capacity to recruit at the pace that we need to recruit. The truth is, though, that virtually every country in the developed world is, ha is having a challenge at the moment in terms of recruitment and retention in the defense forces because of the standard of training now and the number of head and the amount of headhunting that goes on. So, you know, talented people in the defense forces get targeted by the private sector who are offering them more money, um, possibly less hours in terms of work. But what I would say is uh, uh, potentially a lot less job satisfaction uh, and, and opportunity for adventure and, and reward. And don't forget, ultimately, this is about national service. You know, this is about taking an oath to the state, which very, very few people are willing to do, uh, but those who do, uh, it matters to. Um, and my job is to make sure that people who are courageous enough and who are looking for that opportunity and adventure and personal development that comes with joining the Defence Forces, that they are paid fairly, that they're given an opportunity to, to be promoted and to progress in their careers, and that, and that they're, uh, they're opened up to the opportunities and the adventures of what people look for when they join the Defence Forces, which is why I said to you earlier, I'm so strongly of the view that we need to maintain or increase our presence overseas, if we can, in terms of complex missions that Irish soldiers and, uh, and the, the broader Defence Forces can, can contribute to in the future. I mean, that, that's what it means to be a first world country, you know, that's wealthy, that has the, the capacity to invest in the kind of infrastructure and training and education and skill sets that, that all of you in the Defence Forces have. You know, the, that's a privilege, but the responsibility that comes with that is how do we use that resource? And for me, um, you know, we're a neutral country militarily, but I believe we should be a very proactive uh, neutral country that actually is willing to uh, to make decisions to uh, uh, to to be part of alliances and partnerships, particularly within the EU, but also within the UN, um, so that um, people who join the defence forces get what they sign up for, which is uh, you know a high level of training, access to 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 modern advanced equipment but also access to, you know, a theater of, of operations uh, yeah. that actually, you know, is what you train for. Uh, and, um, and that's why, for example, I'd say to the Air Corps, you know, I, I know we've, I mean, obviously the Army is, is central to peacekeeping operations and has been always. Uh, the, the Naval Service, I, I would like to see the Naval Service being overseas um, uh, regularly. Uh, we don't have the resource right now to be able to do that. Uh, we have to build up our, our numbers. We need to get our fleet back to where it should be. Um, and so we don't have the capacity uh, for overseas missions for the Naval Service right now, but I'd like to get back to being able to do that and being able to commit those assets abroad. And the same for the Air Corps. You know, and, and that's also why I would say the same for, for reservists. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to see huge numbers of reservists going overseas, but certainly there should be the opportunity for... Um, uh, for smaller numbers. So, um, so yeah, this is an opportunity, regardless of whether the rest of the economy is booming or collapsing. Uh, the Defence Forces gives you career certainty, income certainty, opportunities for uh, adventure and personal development. Uh, and for a lot of people, that should be an exciting option, you know, and... Uh, uh, and I hope that the current recruitment campaigns uh, will be as successful as we're, uh, uh, as we're hoping and expecting they will be, because we are a thousand people short, you know. And when you've only got eight and a half thousand, that's a lot of people. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, we need to get those numbers back up. And who knows? The the commission may well recommend that we need to increase the 
uh, the overall target number beyond 9,500. Uh, let's wait and see. Uh, but, um, but for me, you know, in some ways the recruitment and retention is a sort of a, it's a HR management issue. And, um, but it's hugely important because uh, while we're a thousand people short, uh, the options that I have in terms of new missions, new opportunities, uh, are limited because our resources can only be stretched so far. Uh, and particularly when we're working through a pandemic and doing all the other things that are being asked of the Defence Forces at the moment, um, to be able to uh, uh, you know, increase our overseas presence without being at our full complement in terms of numbers is, uh, is a very difficult ask. So um, to young people, look at it seriously um, and um, uh, you won't regret it, I would say. Um, the Defence Force is, is a career that has made an awful lot of people very proud uh, with an enormous amount of job satisfaction and, as, as I say, support and camaraderie. Uh, and for a lot of people, that should be a very attractive uh, career choice. Thanks very much for giving your time, Minister, coming on and joining us today. It was really excellent to be talking to you. Great. Well, look, I, I, I hope we can do it again. Um, I mean, maybe we can do this, you know, once a year or a couple of times a year so that you can put things to me that the people want to hear straight answers on. And uh, look, uh, I mean, we won't be able to deliver everything that everybody wants all of the time. And, uh, you know, as a minister, my job is to make sure that uh, that, that the dis defence perspective from the defence forces, from the Department of Defence, is always part of government thinking uh, on the big debates. And uh, I'd like to think that I make sure that that is the case. But we are at an exciting time of change. You know, there's a, there's a new sec gen in the department, there's a new minister, uh, there's a new programme for government, there's a commission in place. There are, there's going to be changes in terms of senior leadership in the defence forces as well. Um, you know, uh, you know, as the as the chief of staff uh, moves on, I mean, he, I think he's done an incredible job. But you know, this is a this is a time of change and renewal, um, and I hope it's also a, a time of, you know, in some ways, a, a sort of a a new look at what the defence forces means to the country as a resource and as a career opportunity for so many people. Um, and um, so I hope, as a minister for defence, I can be an agent for that kind of reinvigoration and change that's needed, I think, um, in the Defence Forces in a way that many people like yourselves who commit a career to Defence Forces will find both interesting and exciting and, uh, uh, and positive. Um, but look, I, I look forward to talking to you again. Uh, and in the meantime, can I just say, on the COVID side, to everyone in the Defence Forces who have been part of, uh, of the national effort here, uh, it's been heroic. Um, obviously not just by the Defence Forces, but by all of the people who've been providing the emergency response. We've saved many, many lives together. Uh, and uh, and uh, so just to, in particular, to say thank you to all the Defence Force personnel who've been involved in those efforts. It's, it's been fantastic. Uh, hopefully the next time we talk, we'll be talking about COVID in, a, in the past, uh, and we'll be looking ahead uh, to the, the recommendations of... Uh, of the commission uh, and a whole series of, um, uh, of, of new opportunities and recommendations for the Defence Forces. Excellent. I'm sure everybody appreciates that message, Minister, who's serving. And um, thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you. For further information on the Irish Defence Forces, check out our social media channels and military.ie. Serving members are also encouraged to check out the members area of military.ie. The Irish Defence Forces podcast is available on Spotify, Acast, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode was produced by Corporal Keith Harrison, Corporal Karen McAnini, and Sergeant Paul Keeley of the Defence Forces Audiovisual School. The Irish Defence Forces podcast will be back soon with new episodes. Thanks for listening and stay safe.